Okay, so I'm just going to go through this um, smart legal con um, contract canvas. When I say canvas, again, people are maybe wondering what this is all about. So this kind of concept became popular with uh, startups. And I'm a, um, involved in a number of different accelerator programs over the last number of years for early stage startups. Um, we're kind of really trying to find their feet as to what do they do as a business. They might have a piece of IP or might have an idea for um, a piece of software. Uh, blockchain or not blockchain, it doesn't really matter. Um, and how do they, how can they form the key concepts of their business? And this applies tech business, non-tech business, or any business really. So this idea of a canvas is something that's often used by um, accelerators to really get people to nail down what's the value proposition for the business that they are proposing to um, to build and what's the environment that they're going to run in. Um, how do they have, form relationships with customers? Who are their partners? What do they do? Um, who's a partner, who's a potential competitor, et cetera. So, um, and then down into the cost structures as well. So this has been proved to be quite a valuable way of um, thinking about the problem. It doesn't solve the problem, just helps you think about it in a different way. And this can be very, very low tech. Most of the time that this is, I've seen this implemented is not online, although generally these days it is, um, but it's people gathering around a printout of this, normally like an A3 large paper printout with some sticky notes and people go around and move things from um, from point to point and uh, scratch things off, take things on, take things off, or have different versions of the canvas for different potential business models, etc. So it's a useful tool. It's been useful that, again, some of the accelerators that I've worked in, uh, some of the accelerators have also worked in and been in the engineering space, actually. So large engineering firms um, trying to see can they spin out some business unit into its own startup, for example. Um, what that looks like, let's say, for example, a Netflix example here, without going into it in detail. Again, simple as just a one or two words, it can be a little bit more than that, or it can be a question um, that's popped in onto a canvas. There are electronic versions of this that you can drag things on, but you can also do it in a simple PDF and uh, an annotation. It can be a very easy way of doing it. Um, there's a colleague uh, of mine in, in UCL, uh, Louis Durard, who's put together the machine learning canvas. So a kind of domain specific um, type of problem domain. We found this quite useful for our students um, who to kind of think about these problems before they kind of know how to build machine learning and uh, AI type solutions. And again, it's very good if you can go off and build a wonderful algorithm that um, doesn't really think about the problem properly and you can build wonderful software for the wrong thing. And that's not you, that's been around since software has begun. There are also even blockchain versions of this that I've seen. So there's a blockchain canvas and a lean blockchain canvas. So uh, you can uh, follow those links and uh, use that to try and figure out whether a blockchain model is right for your um, your business or you know everything is not necessarily suitable for a blockchain solution, despite what the blockchain vendors might sell you. Uh, so this is my attempt at um, putting together a smart legal uh, contract canvas. So again, work in progress, very early, um, too long, more of a dumping ground in, in certain areas, we might scale it back a little bit, but there is a lot to consider um, because this brings in the legal aspects, brings in the blockchain piece, brings in um, quite a lot of the, the things that are not necessarily considered when you start to, to write the code. Um, developers won't consider a lot of these things, even things like data governance and data protection is always an issue. Um, so it tries to pull together some of these different um, considerations really. And I've tried to model it off the similar environment. So starting with a value proposition, which is core to everything. Why are we doing this? What value would it add? Um, why throw a blockchain at it? Does it need a blockchain? Does it just need some form of contract automation? Uh, what are the cost savings? Is it going to be, how would you m m measure value? And um, are there additional benefits with automation? So not just kind of speeding up the, um, uh, the kind of human aspects, but also if you can start to monitor what's happening on chain, you can start to get some statistics, you can start to do some predictions, some modeling, some analysis. So um, that's what feeds into kind of data analytics, it doesn't have to be machine learning, but it, it can be just basic analysis of um, transactions flowing through your system, et cetera, or breaches um, or potential breaches of contract that uh, you may be currently in or maybe likely to enter in the future. So there's all kinds of other aspects for this when you start to think about if you're going down this road that you might not have considered initially, but it may be a lot of work to build the first one. And there may be a lot of paper 
that needs to be taken out of the system or um, some streamlining to be done in many cases for any kind of digitization aspect um, people want to reinvent the existing process with the, the new tools this has always been a problem so reinventing the existing process with something else that does the same thing is not always the wisest decision right i mean there are more efficient ways of doing things and there's some efficiencies to be gained along the way but the flip side of that is sometimes um, things can seem too simple and um, you know in reality sometimes hard things are, are hard for a reason or there might be legislation or practical issues that, um, that actually may mean that it's a little bit more tricky than the programmer who wants to go in and, and just kind of write the code uh, testing we mentioned in the past also very important i haven't looked at the unit test behind this because it is quite low level but if anybody has done any javascript based um, unit tests in the past they'll be familiar with um, the, the current flow that's there but you have to test for things like boundary conditions um, so all of those assertions on the late delivery and penalty you know you've tried to put in silly things like um, if the item was delivered before the contract was started that kind of stuff you have to at least consider that those kind of things may happen um, or the, the values are too large or too small etc so you have to write a number of different tests, especially where you have thresholds and values. So for example, pricing strategies, if you have uh, 10,000, if, if I'm selling 10,000 of these things to you, you get it at one price. If it's 20,000, another price, and then what happens at that 9,999, 10,000, 10,001, et cetera, or zero conditions, minus numbers. Um, you have to cover off all of these bases because as we said, and the questions that came up there, if you get it wrong, the cost for getting it wrong is quite high and you have to go and undo things or not undo but um, compensating transactions as we said so you really want to try and get it right first time and write those tests before you deploy and that's why things like smart contract auditing is so important or kind of cybersecurity pen testing if you're building any type of uh, system it's something that we do at michigan actually for other uh, companies and uh, we should cyber security business as well um, but it's it's important to try and ensure that at least somebody else has a, another set of eyes on your contract and then as we mentioned there's insurance too as we spoke about earlier um one thing i didn't really talk about too much was the contract life cycle and the states that things can get into um so we've seen the kind of force majeure type situation but then contracts can exist within different states and transition from one state to another how do they transition well that can be really from transactions that come in so you need to think about all of the different states that a contract can get into and when a clause is ex actually executed or requested, should that clause even execute at that point? Or is it something that is invalid in that state? So that's where the logic can get a little bit more complex. Um, it's fine for simple clauses, but as you start to build up more and more complexity into the contract, and that reflects real world examples, then um, yeah, things can start to get a little bit tricky. Governance, we could talk about all day, you know, liability and data protection what's stored on chain, what's not stored on chain, personal identifiable information, et cetera. So GDPR being obviously the biggest issue, you can't undo something like that. If something gets on chain, it's there forever, potentially. Again, blockchain issue, uh, as well as a legal smart contract issue. There's lots to discuss there, but we're not gonna get into all that. Um, the other little bit to point out, data sources, where is your data coming from? We've spoken a little bit about oracles, haven't looked at it in detail, we will do a little bit later, um, but starting to look at, do you trust your external data providers? What happens if they go down? What happens if they give you incorrect information? If you do have multiple sources of data and you get conflicting versions of that, which one do you trust? Do you take averages? Do you kind of round robin who you believe? Um, do you look for variances? And if there's too much variance, do you not accept that or use the last value? Um, how does existing data compared, sorry, how does new data compared to historical data, which is something that um, eHub we're looking at for the weather data. For example, you could be looking at weather data coming in, but that doesn't necessarily tell you anything. But if the uh, clause that's there is around a 10 year storm or something, then, well, you need to know this a 10 year storm. So how do you know that? You have to look back to the historical um, piece of data. And talking about on-chain complexity and gas costs, well, that's going to rack up your gas costs quite significantly if you're running that on a um, public Ethereum network. But most types of situations are not looking at that. Um, but yes, this is all of the kind of aspects of, it's not comprehensive by any means, but um, it is trying to be somewhat of a framework for thinking about these types of problems. 
So if we start up just up on the left, the inputs to a project, who the parties, what data is fixed and what's transactional, this maps back to the late delivery and penalty. Steve and Dan, are, I think were the two parties. Um, some of the calculations and the ergo functions were based on the contract text. Um, so the, the rate of payment and, and the duration of days, et cetera. And some of it is transactional. So we don't know in advance of the contract um, when this box that's been shipped is it actually arrives. We know that maybe it should have arrived within 15 days or something, but we don't know when it actually arrives until it arrives. So that's transactional data. But in order to do the calculation to figure out if there's a penalty, we need to know a combination of both. The data type mapping is important as well. We need to use the right types of data types for the right type of input. So where, how does it map to Concerto and are there existing Accord project model libraries that can help? If you're building something that will help somebody else, can you contribute it back in, which we would like? And then looking at um, variables, et cetera. And measurements could be a bit of a tricky one as well. Data quality, all the kind of stuff that you, you would expect in, in any system that you're building. So I'm not gonna go through line by line on this contract, but uh, thinking, I'm hoping it, it may be useful. Uh, it's a bit small here, but that's why I've asked able to, to share the, the PNG version, um, but uh, I can blow it up into something that's more uh, vector-based um, if necessary, like an SVG version that can scale if it's a little bit too small to see here. Uh, but again, this is a work in progress. Uh, you're the first people to see it outside of our organization. Um, it, love some feedback if you think it's useful, um, if you think it's just kind of another thing, but that's fine. If you have never seen one of these canvases before, Maybe um, it's, it's new to you, so it might be a bit neutral on it, but we can discuss it afterwards. But for the moment, um, I'm hoping it might be useful as a starting point to discuss um, some of the aspects around uh, the clauses that people have, uh, have proposed there. Okay, stop that. Right, let's have a look. I've seen some, some questions come in, so please do keep them coming. Yeah, so that, that was the one about the index cost of labor. So yeah, the classic um, Oracle example, I think, where you need to get that cost of labor materials from a, an outside party. Now, the last one, 4.4.1 contractor, in conjunction with the affiliated contractor, shall prepare a mechanical completion plan for the facilities 180 days prior to the plan start date for mechanical activities. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Brittany, I rec recognize you from, I think, the um, uh, a recent tech working group call. So obviously you're familiar a little bit at least with uh, Accord projects. So I'd love to see what you can come up with on that one. Uh, it looks like a good one to start with. Uh, I'm not sure if you were on the recent call where we discussed just from a legal perspective, the uh, 180 in words and in uh, numerical fashion. So a quick question for anybody out there. If they were different, which two win, or which wins? Is it text or is it the number? Anybody uh, like to hazard a guess at it? This is where we need a quick poll to, uh, to pop this in. I'd love to see what people's um, thoughts are on that. Perva reckons it's text. Everyone's saying text. Oh, big, big fans of text. So nobody's a fan of the numbers then. The numbers don't rule it, it is the text. Maybe one more vote. Anybody think it's numeric? Aha, Dennis thinks it's numbers. Well, in US law anyway, uh, Dennis, I can confirm that it is actually the text. Uh, can't say specifically for English law, but this did come up on a recent Accord project call and was a US based lawyer, can't remember actually where, where he's based in the US, but he indicated that there was a recent uh, case about this where uh, there were two different values and yes it's the text that takes precedence cannot say for sure in english law if anybody has a definitive um, answer on that please do let me know but certainly on in, uh, in the us anyway at least in that particular case it was the uh, the text so that looks like a good one that we could start to um start to look at we start to canvas it and uh, we can start to look at what are the the um the the variables in there so let's use the chat or I don't know if people want to put their hand up um, and kind of talk for a little bit, but let's start brainstorming and pop in. What are the parties? Let's start with the parties. So uh, who were the kind of people or organizations involved in this? So I can see 
two there anyway. Does anybody want to have a guess at what they might be? Pop it in the chat. Or anything else? Yeah, contractor. That's obviously number one, the one that's in uppercase. But there is another one in there as well, from what I can see. Uh, employer is probably mentioned elsewhere in the uh, contract, I presume. But in this particular clause I'm looking at here, there's no reference to employer. Um, but yes, I imagine there is definitely an employer in there. But there is another one that's uh, listed there. Yeah, affiliated contractor um, is in there as well. So that would be, I guess, a, a, another party into this contract. Um, or at least another variable, whether they sign off on things or not, that's you know to be to be determined. But at least we're, we're kind of looking for candidate uh, variables at this point, or candidate um, parties. So main contractor, affiliated contractor, um, plan for the facilities. So I guess anything in uppercase is generally a, a good um, starting point for this. Um, in trying to help with this, actually, I've I've written um, some Python code to start looking at existing clauses that we have and mapping between what might be a likely data type. And it's very rough and ready. Um, it's uh, it's kind of a, just looking at a few simple low hanging fruit, but it's trying to, it won't completely automate this, um, but it is something that I'm, I'm looking to do. It's not ready for kind of submission into a cord, but I'll be working with my, my team, some of which are on here on the call to you to look at a machine learning technique called weak labeling. Um, where we can start to have heuristic rules that try to guess um, this looks like a person, this looks like a, a thing, this looks like a number, this looks like a, a date, that kind of stuff, and then um, a currency, for example, and we can start to try to, you know, once you get enough of these things, uh, guessing at something, but um, they may conflict. Well, the more of these that um, start to look in the right direction, um, you can have a human then checking and compare it against existing contracts that are out there or something uh, has that type and the more contracts that we get then the more likely that we will do uh, we will be able to do a better job at this and then we can start to train machine learning models with uh, some of the natural language processing library uh, advances that have happened in the last say, three years really so there's been a lot going on in that space and it's an area we're actively involved in but right now it's it's manual old school mapping like this um, so contractor um affiliated contractor um Oh, this looks good. It's coming through here now. <laughs> um, employer, we said potentially. Uh, facilities was actually what uh, jumped out at me. So I don't know if facilities gets replaced with an address, for example, or some kind of a name. Um, so the core project has a construct for addresses as well for organizations. So the, the house at and then address number, for example, or address. Uh, and that's kind of locale. Um, flexible as well. So UK versus US. Again, that's the advantage of having a globally distributed team. We, the main um, contributors and maintainers of the code are, are split between the UK and um, UK, US and Australia. As it's fair to say, most of them are in the US. So we have a kind of a global view uh, to a limited degree. It's still very English language centric. Uh, so it'd be great to get more contributors from other languages as well. But we try at least to, to make things work across borders. Um, so who else do we have inside here? So facilities, I think, could be you know listed at a at a place if necessary. But definitely the 180 days, we have a duration construct for, uh, for that, um, and then that can be replaced back into a variable event. Of course, that could be fixed. It could be specified. Maybe that's the law, um, or there might be something that that is not necessarily something that will ever be adjusted. It'd be a constant value and not adjusted in the contract, but at least it is a duration. And we will need to get that into a variable at some point because we're gonna to need to compare against that 180 days um, before the plan started. So plan start date would be the other one that jumps out at me um, because that's ultimately when um, we're gonna compare, right? So we're gonna prepare a mechanical completion plan for the facilities 180 days before the plan start date. So if we think about it, if we know what the plan start date is, so if we have a variable placeholder for that, that will be a date, it won't be a duration. Um, then we can start to feed that in. If we know that 180 days in the future is when the, the, um, uh, the works are due to start. So sometime before 180 days before then, we need to have the mechanical um, 
sorry, what is it? Mechanical completion plan. So thinking about it, what that might look like, when did we get the mechanical completion plan? That looks like the clause to me. That looks like the request in uh, saying the mechanical completion plan arrived on day X. So then the, the logic is basically checking to see um, is the date that the mechanical completion plan, um, the date that it arrives, is it greater than 180 days um, before the planned completion, uh, sorry, start date. And this is an interesting one. Is it greater than or equal to or less than or equal to? And this is what I was talking about, boundary conditions. So uh, can we have some thoughts on that one, please? As to regards to even just reading that clause, which hopefully everybody can read in the chat. Um, what would the what would the comparison be in that particular case? So you're including the day that it arrived as part of that 180. So these are the kind of things that uh, can be interesting to look at. So yeah, feel free to pop in a suggestion in there uh, while I read the next version of this. So contractor, so this is a clause for contractor as built drawings. So a contractor in conjunction with affiliated contractor shall prepare and submit company represent plan, prepare, maintain and verify accuracy. Okay, so we've got a 30 days in there, so 30 calendar days, so that's a good duration. After the mechanical completion, so can we track when the mechanical completion actually occurred? Shan shall submit a revised as-built drawings reflection. Oh yeah, so this is kind of as-built, so therefore there's another plan that needs to come back in at that point. So we need to track those two events. Uh, four complete sets of D size drawings obtained in, or sorry, organized in binders. Uh, tricky one to, <laughs> again, this is um, back to paper, right? Do we automate that exact um, requirement? How do we, how do you get a blockchain to recognize if um, a drawing was inside a binder or not? So this is, this is a very practical thing. Uh, when I look at in the smart legal contract, contract uh, environment section. It's kind of all around that. What is the environment this thing actually runs in? So you can imagine imagine your solidity function in Ethereum. How do you how do you code against that? How do you how do you get your code to check to see if something is in a binder and was it D size, whatever the hell D size is? So this is the the practical difficulty of, of trying to do this in in, in practice. Uh, so how do you um, how do you map that real world event back into something? So somebody needs to claim that it was there and anybody can claim that it was there. So I think it would kind of case where both parties, or maybe it's again, back to an Oracle, um, but I don't think it, everything needs to be through an Oracle, but um, somebody will need to check to make sure that it's in um, that binder format of the right size, etc. So I think there's probably a lot more in there just because they're kind of um, uh, in that binder doesn't necessarily mean, I guess it, it doesn't describe how the drawings are supposed to be to be done that may be um, probably defined elsewhere in the contract i'm guessing that's probably one more for able than than for me on that on that one um yeah it seems to be more of a with the with the particulars of this type of uh, contract but yeah that's that's a tricky one to get on chain uh four sets of electronic files for cad drawings on electric media that sounds like it's an easier um an easier one to deal with it's still it's electronic media that could mean usb stick or something Ideally, what you want to do is to try to prove that that was um, uh, delivered in an electronic environment. Maybe that's sort of put on chain. Not that the plans themselves might be put on chain, but maybe the hash of the of the plan um, would be put on chain, and that can later be verified that there's an electronic document. It's a bunch of ones and zeros. Once we add up the state of that ones and zeros, we can get a SHA-256 hash of that. For example, we can store that on chain, potentially. Um, you may not want to store the entire plan on chain. I can't imagine in most cases why you would. All you need to do is prove that you have four versions of that and that later you can verify, yes, this was um, this particular electronic drawing that um, has been sort of timestamped and, and hashed on a, on a blockchain. Uh, so that's that's a little bit trickier. How about a simple one? Main contra contractor executes payment to subcontractor upon validation, completion of works by quality, controlled consultants. Uh, well, payments are definitely a bit easier. That's for sure. So who's paying who? Got a main contractor, uh, not case, in this case, it's not specifying how much the payment is, but we, it's probably referred to in, in a transaction or maybe elsewhere in the contract. So main contractor paying a subcontractor. 
uh, upon validated completion of works by quality control consultants. Key thing here is how do you, how do those quality control um, consultants uh, verify that the work has been done and how do they indicate to the system uh, that this has been completed? And obviously there are various different ways that this happens, but let's say for example, um, it could be via web interface. That web interface will then generate a, a transaction that can then be put onto a blockchain and then trigger um, a smart legal agreement. And it could be a simple Boolean value that comes in saying, uh, yes, it's complete, it's valid, it's okay. Um, where it gets a little bit trickier is if it's not valid, but partially valid or 80% of the way there, or what do you do then at that point? It's either from a contractual perspective, it's either complete or not complete. Um, or so it's, um, yeah, validated completion of works. So from the contractual perspective, there is no 95%, it is either complete or not complete. So it's a Boolean yes or no value. Um, you, you, could stem, you could then start to go into, well, partially complete, and I don't know if there's um, any provisions inside the contract for that. But again, this is where it gets a bit more complex. So where you might have a partial payment, for example, if you're 80% of the work done, maybe you have some agreement where 80% of the funds are released. Generally, I know that's not necessarily the way it works in construction and many other domains, um, but there are some where that would happen. And then how do you degree? One party might say, well, it's 80%, the other person might say it's 60%. Um, so it's, uh, that's where it starts to get a little bit tricky. Okay, this next one looks good. Percentage weighting criteria. Okay, production drawing. Initial drafting. Okay, this is a good stage one. That seems to be quite useful as well as to what stage um, people are at. Then they verify that that stage has been completed to satisfaction and that can trigger the releasing of a certain amount of, um, of money at that point. So we see there weighted 20%, weighted 45%. That looks like a nice one potentially for, for legal smart contracts um, to potentially pop in there. So again, as I mentioned, the contracts can have states. You can model this as a state transition. So for example, um, discipline check, um, that's, well, actually, is it linear? Now that might be my misunderstanding of this from looking at it initially, but presumably this initial drafting has to happen first, drafting complete. So therefore drafting complete must happen before initial drafting. So if you get a, a request in to transition from a state from draft to complete back to initial drafting, that to me sounds like an, uh, some, something is, is wrong there. So that's the kind of thing you might do at an enforce level. So enforce that um, drafting complete cannot, um, ha sorry, initial drafting cannot, cannot happen um, uh, after drafting, after you're already in the drafting complete or a later phase. However, I could be wrong in a situation uh, where maybe it's a little bit further down here where there were revisions, obviously. So maybe it goes all the way through, something is found to be incorrect or invalid against building regulations or uh, whatever, nobody's happy with the final drawing. And maybe you do have to go back to the, the initial draft again. That's the only thing that I can think of. But normally this looks like a fairly sort of linear process. Uh, how do we define satisfactory in smart legal contracts? Yeah, that's, that, that is the, the key thing. It's either done or not done, zero or one, but the gray area on satisfaction stays. Exactly, that's the point I was mentioning before, is unless you have some kind of gradient, some kind of, it could be an enumerated type of um, everything from shoddy to half done to nearly there, you could define those kind of ranges or, or a proper equivalence of them. Um, and instead of sending through a binary body, you could send through a, new, uh, a list of enumerated types. Again, both parties would have to agree um, that this is the actual status. Uh, but it is pretty, I mean, even the legal agreement here is, is pretty binary on that, right? So if the legal agreement, sorry, if the smart legal contract is reflecting um, the full text, which it should be, then it's a binary decision in the paper contract as well. So maybe the paper contract or uh, this is where you needs to be updated or it's, um, and some of these things come from the, the basis of trying to be kind of realistic where you couldn't necessarily have an accurate representation of this or it was too inefficient. And um, there were considerations put into these clauses that are not that flexible because that degree of automation wasn't there when these uh, contracts were written many, many years ago in certain cases. So it may be that it's time for lawyers to think about things in a different way and start revising these clauses so that they can be a little bit more computationally friendly. So even if a lawyer does not write the code, if the lawyer understands these type of constructs and, and what 
what can be achieved, then it might influence how you draft your legal clauses so that they are easier to compute, they are easier to deal with these kind of um, non-binary sort of uh, ranges of, of inputs, etc. So, um, but again, there are various reasons, maybe from, you know, the construction industry is, is interesting in how it works um, in this area as regards to holding money until um, you absolutely have to get rid of it, etc. Um, there may be very good reasons why it is weighted in that way, where they don't want a binary. They will file one tiny little thing that will say, no, no, uh, this was not complete, therefore we're not releasing that payment and that can hold things up, et cetera. So we all know that that's the, the way that these things work. So there might be valid reasons um, within the kind of environment as to why these clauses are written in that way as well. So again, smart legal contract that is just a representation of the existing contract is going to just reinforce that behavior in certain cases. So um, it's not a silver bullet in that case. So bear in mind that technology is, is not the problem here <laughs> in some of these cases. Okay, some very good examples in here. I'll, I really like this um, stage based one here, the initial drafting, drafting complete, um, et cetera. And then finally completion, the final, final issue. So it looks like a nice linear relationship. There may be steps back, I'm, I'm not sure from this. Can, can you enter or, or re-enter or, or there cycles that could happen? Um, I think it's, it's maybe an idea to try and kind of take some of these because there's, there's quite a few here now and that's really very, very useful. That's what we want to try and, and look at. Pause for a few minutes. Um, I have a video that describes how to create um, these legal smart contracts on your own computer. If you wanted to kind of, the next step would be to, to start to, um, to do that. Um, I can share actually just the, the template studio but, um, for those that don't want to do it um, on, your, on your own environment and maybe take some of these and start popping them into the text editor and start to, to draft what this might look like in practice. So am I sharing PowerPoint? Not anymore, I don't think. Um, let me bring up the template studio link. Um, which is in the slides I've sent earlier that I just need to find it or you just go to the Accord website. Maybe we don't need to play that video just yet because uh, not everybody will do it that way. So let me just share my screen again. Okay, can everybody see this? This is the Accord project um, documentation. So I've recorded a video which is their getting started to install Cicero, run through the Hello World template. It's entirely the same as this tutorial because you can read the tutorial yourself and there are really good videos. I changed it uh, slightly to use a different Hello World example. Um, so there's a Hello World with state, very, very similar. But if you can go through this, all my video does is describe how to do this, these three pages effectively. But what I think is actually more valuable is if you go into Template Studio. So this is studio.accordproject.org. Uh, this is the um, example from eHab, actually. So this is my first practical time doing this, actually, where I've taken a CTA file built by some, somebody who was not inside the Accord project. They packaged it up. They sent it to me. I uploaded it into Template Studio, and it worked, which is fantastic. Um, not that I, I doubted it, but uh, it's kind of the first time I've actually done it end to end like that. Um, so this is their contract with um, the uh, NEC domain. So they're trying to contribute some of this weather state information back into the, so, um, into the public domain. They have not given me permission to do that at this point. So I know that they're probably going to do it. So I'm not going to go through their contract in, um, in detail. I think they are okay with me doing that. I do know the guys, but I, I don't want to do it. There might be some um, contractual or... Um, Sort of sensitivities around that or, or, or something. So again, this all kind of just came into me before the, um, the workshop started, but I think it's a very important step forward. We can see some of the logic, I'll just skip over here. So the weather state, you see it's far more complicated than some of the examples that we've been looking at because it's a real world example. But we start to see here, max temperature, wind speed, the days below zero, um, the days above five mil of rain, etc. So real world example, working through an NEC, um, or sorry, is it NEC or JCT? So NEC, yeah. Um, so you can do something like that. You can easily go into studio.accordproject.org. Um, we can start with an acceptance of delivery clause. So this is not the clause itself. This is just a readme to describe the project. Um, structured a little bit like this, the text. 
is um, it's up here. You can have a, a sample uh, for party A. This is a bit longer acceptance criteria. This is that JSON data that I said that represents all of the different variables that are inside there. Um, and then you can start to look at the data model behind it. So here's the transaction. This is the first time we've seen an enum, but this is again, a, a like a Boolean, you can, you can have one or zero or true or false. You can have um, one stage of inspection, which would map quite nicely to that example. And um, I forget who it was, shared it in the chat about those stages that you can be at around initial drafting to final draft, et cetera. That would be generally a very good way of, of doing it rather than a load of if statements, um, enums, kind of lock that down so it can't be in an invalid state. Um, acceptance of delivery, et cetera. So business days. So there's lots of very good examples in there. These are the ones that are out there. Some of them are duplicated, um, full payment on demand. Uh, upon signature, this is one clause have an integration with DocuSign um, where they can have these legal smart contract agreements started on somebody um, signing a PDF in DocuSign and then it will trigger the agreement actually executing and it won't execute until both parties have signed, for example. Uh, the Hello World and Hello World State are, are in here as well. So there's quite a few, there's classic late delivery and penalty and all of the different variations. Uh, my currency conversion one has not come in here yet because I have to wait for the next version of Ergo to be released. And it's a small dependency that's specific because it's money related. It's a little bit of an anomaly. We don't normally have these issues in uh, rolling out third party clauses. We can turn them around pretty quickly. So there's lots of variations on that. So all this late delivery type stuff, it's a problem in many different domains. So I'd say have a, a start at that. Um, ha have a look at that. Perishable goods. Maybe we'll have a look at this one. Um, again, I think this was based off an IBM demo with Hyperledger, which had IoT devices tracking um, to see what temperature something um, was sustained at in shipping. So for example, as it was in transit, what was the humidity? What was the centigrade? And it wasn't necessarily, I think in this example, did it ever go above a particular temperature or below a particular temperature, but how long was that sustained for? Um, that could be wrong. I haven't looked at this example in a, in a long time. Um, no, in this particular case, it, it is actually looking at the extremes. What was the lowest reading? What was the highest reading? Because you can see this min and max inside of there. Um, then um, there's a penalty factor for that as well. So, but I guess you could write the thresholds as well if you really wanted to. Um, and that will depend on how frequently you're sampling the temperature, I guess. If you're doing it every second, that's one thing. If you're doing it every minute or every hour, then um, obviously it's a little bit kind of more coarse grained. So lots of different examples that are out there. I know some of you have probably been playing around this already, but I think this is the best way to learn is by seeing what's out there. And then maybe if a few of you want to go ahead um, and actually try this. So start here with the text, start playing around with these contracts. You might get a few errors, don't worry about it. Um, yes, you can do this on your own machine, um, but I do find this as a, a nice playground. There is another tool called, uh, um, well, we'll go through it a little bit later. So it's called Dingus for just doing the contract text and variables itself. But I think uh, this is quite useful. So we're going to pause for a second, um, more than a second, actually a few minutes again. Let's give us a, a breather. Um, I feel my throat getting a bit dry. It's quite dry around here at the moment. The rains have uh, came a few days ago, but it's, it's, it's very uh, non-humid here at the moment, uh, which doesn't help. So I think this is a, a good time to play around with these yourself. So you get a, a feel for um, the templates that are there. And yeah, let's um, let's have a go at maybe putting some of these together and I'd love to see if anybody has some examples that they'd like to share um, when we come back. Even just starting with the contract text, let's not worry about the Cicero or Ergo just yet, but let's um, maybe start with marking up some of those clauses. That'd be fantastic. Um, so it's what, eight, uh, need to make sure, wrong time zone, I'm uh, 10 past five. Um, running low on time, didn't want to show the uh, Cicero examples, but I think this is, well, it's up to you, Abel. What, what do you think? Um, how do you want to spend the next? Sure. Are, are you going to um, play the videos or, or you'll leave this for later? Um, I can leave it for later, potentially. It's a 20 minute long video, but I think for what people need to do to get started, they can do a template studio. They can do that online. Um, okay. And then we can start to have a look at the core of stuff a little bit later. But again, okay. not too many developers on here. so. I don't want to lose people in the, the weeds of Kotlin and Java and Ergo. Um, so yeah, I think it's 
more useful if people go and try and see what a, a clause would look like when it's marked up and try out the tool. Right, so uh, it's quarter past five here in mm -hmm. the UK. So we come back at um, five, five, 25, 10 minutes, is that okay? Yeah, 10 minutes, have a first crack at it and feel free to just paste in any of those examples. It doesn't have to be one that you've, um, you've, you've done yourself inside there. So take somebody else's and just say, put the little curly braces around it, uh, whichever way you want to do it, let's, let's just uh, share it out from there. But you can use that online tool for just validating that your syntax is right, et cetera.